Right, okay. I think I'm gonna kick off. So, thank you everybody for coming. This is absolutely incredible to see so many people here today. I'm Becky Anderson. I'm the Director of Engagement at the Chancery Lane Project. And we have, I think, pretty much the whole Chancery Lane team here as well, who are gonna be able to answer your questions and I'm really excited to see them over the course of today. Um, welcome to the launch of the Net Zero Toolkit. Thank you everybody for coming. So I just wanted to very quickly say for anybody who is here who doesn't know very much about the Chancery Lane Project, we are a non-profit pro bono organization and we bring together lawyers to do drafting, peer review, and ultimately publishing contract clauses and other materials to help lawyers tackle climate crisis. And those materials are all available on our website for free for commercial or non-commercial purposes. What we care about is that they get used and the carbon comes out. So today we are really proud to launch the Net Zero Toolkit. This has been an amazing collaborative effort across lawyers and industry experts and has encompassed many hundreds of hours of pro bono volunteer time. So we're going to be taking a very quick tour of the Net Zero Toolkit. We're going to be hearing a few words from two of our lawyer champions, Shirag and Tabby. Um, and we're going to be announcing a lot of the events that we're going to be running in, um, in the kind of lead up to COP26 and the Lawyers Pro Bono Week. And there will be a big Q&A section for you to ask us whatever you need to ask us about the new materials. So, net zero. As I mentioned, this is the launch of the Net Zero Toolkit, which is a really ambitious piece of work, and it would not have been possible without the help and support of many of the people here today on this call. So thank you for your immense effort, everybody. But I really wanted to start by asking the question, what is Net Zero? Because I'm a lawyer, there's a lot of lawyers on this call, and we love a definition. Um, and sadly, there is no universal definition for Net Zero. Um, that's going to be one of the kind of starting points for how do we talk about net zero in contracts. I've put up this quote from the IPCC because I think it's a good starting point, but it's pretty technical. Um, and I think as lawyers, we need to have a good understanding of what net zero is before we can even start to think about putting it into contracts. Knowing about what net zero is, being able to put it into contracts is I think as a lawyer is essential because if we're going to stop the worst of climate change, then we need to make our net zero targets have real proper bite. And I think in the absence of legislation, obviously this is a lot of what the Chancery Lane project is about, in the absence of legislation, that bite for us comes from contractual obligation and contractual enforcement. So the net zero toolkit was our focus for March of 2021. I think largely is a response to COP26, which as you all know, is happening in a few weeks time. The race to zero is a huge part of COP26 and there, there will be, or there has been a real flood of race to zero commitments. I know, for example, um, only two days ago, I think it was two days ago, DocuSign made their race to zero commitment. So great job, DocuSign. Um, and I, at this point in time, at least A third of FTSE 100 companies have made the pledge already, and that means that virtually everybody on this call is either in a company who has made a net zero pledge or has a client who has made a net zero pledge. And this really, the question is, how do we help people make those pledges a reality? How do we get from a pledge to meaningful action to the on-time delivery of greenhouse gas savings. That is the key task and it's a huge one. So we're here producing materials to support lawyers in making the race to zero real, actionable, practical, operationalized for clients, but ultimately enforceable. I think lawyers have a particularly special skill set here in taking complicated ideas and making them specific, measurable, clear, and legally enforceable. And that's what we need to do here because, to be honest, nothing says commitment more than voluntarily putting yourself on the hook for damages for breach. So, many people are going to be delivering pledges in the next few weeks. This is the lawyer's blueprint for helping them make them a reality. What is in the Net Zero Toolkit? Quite a lot. Um, I'm going to try and 
get a bit of a balance between explaining what's in there um, and uh, making sure I hit my time commitments for this presentation. So <clears throat> the first part of the toolkit is what we're calling the net zero implementation tools. And you can see here, um, uh, there is going to be a video, a net zero explainer, and a lot of materials which upskill lawyers and upskill other people in um, delivering net zero, teaching you about what it is, how that fits in with the lawyer's duties and how you can take that learning and push it into contract clauses. Um, then there's going to be a section obviously of clauses right at the end, best in class net zero clauses and we also have new clauses coming out which are industry um, themed it clauses aligned with the COP26 themes for the year. Don't worry if I appear to be scooshing through these slides very quickly. I think that the really key pieces that are going to be useful to virtually everybody, I'm going to be doing a deeper dive on those right now. So I want to start with the Net Zero Explainer and the Net Zero Dashboard. As I said at the start, I think a lot of lawyers are not going to know what net zero is in enough detail to make it a contractually enforceable commitment. They might not even know why it's important to their clients, how to help their own organisations get to net zero. So the first part of our toolkit is really about getting people up to speed with knowledge and understanding in the context of legal contracting and what you can do in your day to day work to really embed net zero targets. So the first thing we have is actually a very short 12 minute video, um, which is a really high level introduction to net zero for lawyers. It is absolutely perfect size for you to be putting into team training or for you to be giving to clients in client training. And it gets everybody on the same page, which I think is a really important first starting point to shifting organizations um, into a net zero aligned space. After the net zero video, we have the net zero explainer. This builds on the video, it's a much more detailed document. It contains a lot of links to resources so that you can direct your own learning, but it's always contextualized in terms of what do lawyers need to know. There are seven elements to the net zero explainer and you're going to see those elements as a golden thread throughout the rest of the resources, um, but I'm very quickly going to run you through them. So the first is scope, this is really scope one, two, three. Um, scope one being direct company owned or controlled emissions occurring at source. Scope two, the emissions associated with the production of energy consumed by company. And scope three, everybody's favorite, scope three emissions, which is those indirect emissions associated with company activities, or it's the thorny issue of your supply chain, your value chain and that sort of thing. The second element is warming. And this is very, very simply and very clearly on your organization or your client's current trajectory, what level of warming are you currently aimed at? Is it 1.5 degrees? Is it two degrees centigrade? Or is it even higher? Where are you currently heading to and where do you want to get to in terms of your warming target? Targets and timing, what is your path and path, uh, pace for decarbonization? Are you aiming to hit 1.5 by 2050? Or by 2030, or are you actually going to be, are you actually on a, a trajectory of hitting six degrees by 2050, that sort of thing. Offsetting, we felt it was really important to put offsetting in here because a lot of organizations look to offsetting as sort of like a, a silver bullet to solve their carbon problems and it is a real minefield um, that you have to look very carefully at your mitigation hierarchy, the quality assurance of the offsetting organisations that you're, you're working with and so we wanted to have a section in here on offsetting and there is in fact a whole paper on offsetting and mitigation to help you navigate these problems. Um, governance, I'm sure it's going to be absolutely no surprise to anybody on this call that the sort of top level commitment is required in the same way that that bottom level contractual operationalization is required. So we have a section on what good governance looks like in terms of delivering on net zero. What is that top level commitment? Do you have interim targets, transparency, regular reporting and tracking? What does that look like? Do you have clear plans with specific operational implications taking you, as I said, all the way through from top level decision making right down to 
how does a contract get delivered and is the delivery of a contract taking the carbon out just transition um, are the actions that you have chosen to deliver your targets unthinkingly doing more harm than good are they un unknowingly doing harm to vulnerable group groups can you assess that prior to putting your plans in place to make sure that this is a just transition and not just a transition for your organization and lastly and i think this is a really really difficult topic but one that needs to be looked at um, what is your climate policy engagement and what that means is who are you lobbying who are your clients lobbying uh, what trade associations are you giving money to and who are they lobbying? We've already seen in the States that there has been organisations that have been called out very publicly for having one climate and race to zero style target and paying huge amounts of money into lobbying and trade organisations um, which do not uh, align with the Paris Agreement and which are trying to push legislation solutions which are not in alignment with the Paris Agreement. And there's a real reputational um, piece of damage there that can be done, I think. If you look over onto the other side of the screen, um, you're going to see our net zero dashboard and there's going to be um, a much, much bigger and better version of this on the website. So if, you, if it, that's too small for you to read, don't worry. Um, but this is a really simple graphic that we've created for an organization to map itself against. So taking those seven areas from the net zero explainer and putting them into a map here. So you have on the left hand side of the map, really minimal ambition um, or very low ambition in terms of net zero. I would argue no ambition for some of these actually, but the scope, the, the, the column on the left is going to be, um, you only look at scope one emissions, you're on target for a temperature rise above two degrees C, you don't have board oversight, you're actively funding anti-climate lobbying and all of that sort of thing. And then we move all the way over to the right hand side column, which is in alignment with the Paris Agreement and then where do you go after Paris? And the idea is that you can see where your organization sits on this dashboard in relation to these seven key areas. And that will give you the targets you need to move across to the right hand side and show you the metrics and the standards that you need to be hitting to move your organization over. So our clauses, which I'll get to in more detail in a moment, really span this entire pathway from the low ambition or the light green clauses all the way through to high ambition or what we call dark green clauses. So for example, we have a new clause, which is Eddie's recital. And for those of you who are new to TCLP, all of the clauses are named after children who are in the lives of the drafters. So Eddie's recital, um, so a recital might affect contract interpretation, but it's not going to be a really hard legal obligation in the same way something else could be. It just gets everybody in the contract on the same page. Following that thread all the way through, we've got a really high ambition clause, a dark green clause such as Owen's clause, which embeds contract specific targets as a proportion of a company's corporate net zero target, and then enforces those targets with a suite of mechanisms such as termination, offset payments for failure and that sort of thing. And there's a real kind of range. And the idea of having a range of clauses means that you can meet people where they are and start moving them from the left to the right hand side of the dashboard. If you want the really high ambition contract clauses to deliver your high ambition net zero targets, then you need to be looking at the best in class net zero clauses that we're publishing today. And I'm going to get to those in a moment. Next, we have a drafting checklist. So this is actually a version of the resources and the documents that we use to align our best in class clauses with race to zero and net zero. So this is a checklist which takes you through 22 questions to assess your drafting or your existing contracts. Um, you obviously won't need all 22 questions for every single contract. You need to pick and choose to suit your organization and to suit your goals and suit the type of contract that you're putting in place. But it takes the following areas that are in this bullet point and translates them into what it means for actual drafting. So you have the race to zero starting line, um, you have leadership practices, you have the net zero dashboard, which we've already explained with those key elements of an ambitious program. And that's showing you again, the path you need to take from low ambition to high ambition. 
And the net zero drafting checklist is organized again, according to those seven areas that we identified in the net zero explainer. So you can see again, that golden thread coming all the way through. So these really are just uh, are tools to help you look at your own practice, look at your own organization, look at your own drafting and see where you currently are and what it will take to get you where you've pledged to be. Um, I just wanted to give one example of one of the questions in the drafting checklist, and it falls into that just transition um, uh, bucket that we talked about earlier, which is under just transition, a question that you might ask yourself is how, how can and how are you including a requirement for parties to consult and map with the wider local and global stakeholders that are affected by climate risk and transition to improve resilience? Um, so again, it's lots of questions to help you focus your mind as lawyers and drafters and advisors to the place that you need to be going to, to serve your clients the best. So next is the net zero clauses. So again, as I've already mentioned, we have a span of clauses here from light green to dark green, which is all about providing organizations with the choice and the capability to start from where they are, but, with the expectation that they'll be moving steadily across that dashboard until they're in the high ambition column. Uh, and I think that everybody on this call will recognize that calibrating advice, calibrating contracting to the capability of an organization is actually really key. Um, as, as a former contracts lawyer, you know, I love an enforcement mechanism, but if we put in place really hard, really high ambition targets for a company that isn't ready, it's not going to make them ready. They'll fail to comply. They might get terminated. There might be some damages or some breach um, penalties if it's a supply chain contract, but the greenhouse gases are not coming out. And that's what this is really about. This is aimed at making sure at the end of the journey, we have successfully reduced and removed those greenhouse gases. And we have to do that by starting where people are, but giving them a very clear plan to move them across. And the best in class clauses really represent that final end point. What we've done with the best in class clauses is we've taken 20 of our contract clauses that we have already on our website and we have amended them and marked them up to make sure that they are Paris Agreement aligned, to make sure they fulfill race to zero requirements, as mentioned on the previous slide, and to make sure that they're consistent with the OXA principles for net zero aligned carbon offsetting. And I think it's really important to say that these do not replace earlier versions of the clauses. Those earlier versions of the clauses are the light green versions. They are still very useful. They are still there for people who are not at the, um, that far right hand column of the dashboard. Um, and this allows clause, uh, organizations to better pick and choose the combination of clauses that suits them best. And it's not just that these are light green versus dark green clauses even, but there might be in your industry, in your organization, it might be that our earlier clauses actually just suit your needs better in terms of reaching your net zero target. We also have, I'm really excited to, um, to tell you, the first tranche, I think 18, uh, I'm sure one of my colleagues will correct me if that's not right, 18 new clauses that have come out of the drafting workshops that many of you participated in over the spring and the summer. Um, and these include uh, Raphael's procurement due diligence questionnaire, which is a climate change due diligence questionnaire for suppliers that you might want to use at the tender stage, um, Rose's clause, which is a greenhouse gas emissions management plan in infrastructure and construction project finance. Um, one of the things I'm really excited about is a new suite of corporate governance clauses to help people at that top level of an organization set a clear direction. Um, so we have ELSI's resolutions, which is shareholder resolutions relating to a company's climate change commitments. Javier's clause on stakeholder, which is a stakeholder company climate questionnaire. Griff's clause, a template board paper for significant contracts and transactions to make sure that you're reviewing significant contracts and transactions with a climate lens as well as other risk lenses. Uh, and Lila's clause, which is a board paper implementing net zero for SMEs, um, who I think have a particular um, problem in that they don't always have the resources available to them that some of the really large companies do. Um, 
what else are we going to be doing over the next few months to support you though? Because we recognize at TCLP that providing you with clauses is really a fraction of the work that needs to be done because getting those clauses into contracts can be hard. That can be really difficult. Um, there can be a whole host of reasons for that, a whole host of obstacles. Um, and so supporting you in overcoming those obstacles is a really key part of what we do as well as just providing the materials. So we're going to be running a series of events from the 1st of November through to the 12th of November to support you in implementing the clauses and learning from the Net Zero Toolkit to um, take those lessons away into your own drafting. Uh, we're going to be doing our first set of events over pro bono week. Um, these will be what we call climate clauses in action events, one each day over pro bono week. Um, covering the following COP aligned themes of finance, supply chains, transactions and deals, built environment, corporate governance. And those are going to be looking in detail at a curated set of clauses and then having a really open and honest and productive conversation on what the barriers are, why they're not practical and what we can do to change that or why they are practical, but um, what extra support you might need to get them in place. The following week, we're going to be running drafting for net zero workshops on exactly the same themes. These form a sort of a second part to the first set of events, but you can turn up to either mix and match. So don't worry if you miss one. And this is going to be teaching you how to draft for net zero in your own practice or your own organizations in those areas. Um, and then we're also going to be running some workshops on how to run your own internal events in a sort of a train the trainer style. So please sign up to those because we'd absolutely love to see you there and support you through that process. And really that, that that's sort of it. I appreciate it's a whistle stop tour, but we only have an hour and um, there's a lot of people on this call. So <clears throat> we can only provide you with the space and the tools and it's up to every lawyer, industry expert, procurement professional and anybody who deals with contracts to really take these tools and clauses and put them into use because that's how we're going to get the carbon out and prevent the crisis so the next steps are yours um, we are here to support you so please sign up to our newsletter we're going to be doing a rolling release of new clauses from now until the early part of next year in all sorts of exciting areas like construction finance insurance so if you sign up to our newsletter you'll get those straight into your inbox please come to our drafting events. And of course, look at our clauses, look at our toolkit, use them and tell us about it because we love hearing um, success stories. So thank you ever so much for listening to me telling you all about what's going on. What I'd really like to do now is to have you listen to some of the people who have been with us on this journey and supported us and, and hear about what their experience has been of TCLP. So if I could pass over to um, Tabitha Gould, who I'm pretty sure I've seen on the call, if you want to introduce yourself, Tabby, and just um, tell everybody about your experience for five minutes, then that'd be really, really exciting. Yeah, thanks, Becky. Um, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, Hello, my name is Tabby Gould. I'm an NQ at Burgess Salmon based in Bristol, um, and I've recently qualified into the construction and engineering team there. Um, and I also trained with the firm and during both my training contract and now as an NQ and hopefully moving forward, I've been very actively involved in the Chancery Lane project. Um, I also co-founded the Chancery Lane project initiative at our firm, which helps to sort of spread the word about what TCLP is doing across lawyers across the firm um, and just, yeah, get, get awareness out there of all the great things that they're doing. Um, so during my time um, so far with TCLP, I've been involved in a number of drafting events. Um, I helped facilitate a real estate uh, session, even though I'm not a real estate lawyer. Um, and that's where I met Shirag, who you're going to hear from after as well. Um, we helped draft a clause on um, encouraging circular um, economy principles into real estate leases, um, especially around um, repair and alteration clauses. Um, and I also helped draft um, an energy clause looking at transparency in the supply chain uh, for renewable energy assets um, and how we can kind of bring that um, into supply chain contracts. Um, and yeah, across, across the firm, we've been helping spreading the word about what Chancery Lane Project do. We've been running various departmental training sessions about it, how it relates to each sector and how people at Burgess Salmon can get more involved. 
And I suppose just one of the reasons why I've, well, um, a number of reasons why I've loved being involved is, um, firstly, it was really great to join an online community during COVID with similar minded people um, and kind of have that connection with other people and really like broaden my network as well. So that's been, that's been great. Um, but yeah, I've always been passionate about trying to um, help the environment and combat climate change and I didn't really know what I could do to help. And I think when I attended the first uh, TCLP session and Matt said, um, you know, what, what are we doing? I think your daughter asked you, what, what can we do as lawyers or what are you doing? Um, and that really resonated with me. And I think joining the Chancery Lane project and working on the clauses has really helped me feel like I can make a bit of a difference. And um, I am helping in that fight, even though it is a big fight, uh, but we are all here together. Um, and it's really nice to have a kind of community of people doing that together. Um, so for me, it, and it's brought focus into my work as well, I think I'm doing, um, um, I've qualified into construction engineering and for me obviously net zero is a huge part of of construction engineering um, and you know the sector completely needs to reduce their carbon emissions and it's given me a lot more focus in the work that I do day to day um, and helped me actually to engage with what our clients are doing and what the sector is doing and think you know what can we be doing more within this sector um, and that's brought a lot of excitement to my role you know I like getting up in the morning and doing my work because I actually feel that we're doing something different we're changing something it's not just the same old day day job so yeah it's exciting and and um, it's nice to feel a part of something. And I suppose also as an MQ and as a junior lawyer, it has really benefited my career so far. You know, I've been able to um, broaden my network externally, but also internally. I feel like I'm much more recognized across the firm now for the work that I am doing with the Chancery Lane project. Um, I'm having a lot more involvement with partners um, and going along to, well, being involved in kind of pitch documents and strategy documents and sort of speaking to partners at those strategy levels. Like how can we think to bring in these net zero principles into the work that we do um, so that's really opened a lot of doors for me and hopefully will continue to open a lot of doors for me as I progress through my career and at Burgess Salmon as well we're finding that we are getting a lot of clients asking us are we involved in the Chance Three Lane project are we actively working with them um, for a new client that we've just taken on it was a prerequisite to winning their work we had to be involved in the Chance Three Lane project and for other clients um, especially clients in the um, energy sector and utility clients and especially those in the water sector they've come to us asking if we can be a part if we can help them um, include some of the TCLP clauses into their framework agreements so that's really exciting because those will be really long-standing contracts that we're hoping to to bring TCLP clauses into um, so yeah I think for me it's a really great initiative I'm really pleased that I've become part of it um, I love the online community there is and hopefully it will keep going um, from strength to strength and looking forward to taking the net zero to toolkit back to my colleagues and saying right let's do it let's get it implemented so yeah thanks oh, that's that's absolutely fantastic, Tabby. Um, I also wanted to ask uh, Chair Aguirre from Howard Kennedy if uh, he could speak a little bit. Uh, absolutely. Thank you so much, Tabby. Uh, my name is Chair Aguirre. Uh, I'm a, a real estate lawyer at Howard Kennedy. Um, I'm also currently leading a campaign um, because we too... Um, can you hear me? Hello? You've, you've frozen, but we can hear you. Yeah, sorry, can you hear me now? Um, so we too are finding clients are increasingly asking us about this. Um, in fact, we're bound to COP26 article campaign. Um, apologies, I'm having problems with my Zoom. Um, oh no, I think Shirag's gone. What I might suggest then is if we move on to the Q&A section and then when he comes back, hopefully if he comes back, then we'll fold that um, back in. Um, I was going to ask you, um, given there's so many people on this call, I think there's well over 200, if you have questions, please put them in the um, chat and we'll pick them up from there and the members of the team will, um, will answer them. And so that's really where to start. Um, I do have some questions already in place oh no shirag's back okay hi sorry about that apologies um so just saying that uh, uh so i'm a real estate lawyer at howard kennedy currently reading an esg uh, real estate campaign as well and we're like tabby said we're also finding clients asking about as about um climate change and cop 26 and we too are really trying to push and educate everyone about tclp 
Um, just in terms of my motivations as to why I joined TCLP, um, I've always wondered how as a commercial real estate lawyer, I could make a real tangible and actionable difference through the work that I do uh, and make an overall positive impact on society. And having lived in three different continents, including Africa, where I was very fortunate to be close to the wild and conservation, um, I've seen how climate change affects us in different ways. And you know, the Chancery Lane project is just such an incredible collaborative effort whereby we can make a real tangible difference to tackle climate change through what we do daily, i.e. drafting. Uh, my first involvement with the project was during a hackathon last year, whereby I came together with lawyers, Claire Harmon Clark, Murray Stickland, Tabby Gold, and Simone Potter. Uh, and we drove uh, drafted clauses to incorporate sustainable and circular economy provisions for repair, alterations, yielding up and decoration covenants in a lease. And this effectively encourages landlords and tenants to reuse goods and materials. Um, it also encourages landlords and tenants to reduce unnecessary waste and prompt them to follow circular economy principles. Um, and I'm really proud to say that this is a net zero clause. It aligns with the Paris government, uh, Paris agreement goals, race to zero requirements and the Oxford principles to net zero. Um, what is really proud, obviously, uh, and you know, I think this was one of the most cathartic and fulfilling experiences of my professional life. What is particularly special was we decided to claw, uh, name the clause after my son, Atme. Uh, and Atme name effectively means long life in Sanskrit. So it was very apt because it was all about the long life of the planet and also long life, long life of our resources. This year, uh, together with Andrew Wallace at Clyde & Co, uh, I co-facilitated a real estate hackathon for the Net Zero Toolkit, uh, where a whole host of clauses were discussed, uh, from service charge clauses, uh, which involved a colleague of mine from Howard Kennedy called uh, Laura Williamson, um, to, to climate change disclosures within certificates of title and various others. Um, I've also had the opportunity to work with Jenny Ramos uh, and other colleagues on retrofitting existing clauses to make them more aligned with Net Zero. Uh, and, you know, I have to say the net zero video, the explainer, the dashboard, they're just so invaluable to facilitate that process. Um, I think it's really important to point out, as Becky mentioned, it's, it's all about calibration. It's all about calibrating the clauses to the needs of the organization and starting from somewhere. The toolkit contains like a smorgasbord of light green to dark green clauses. Um, and it's not that all the new clauses are aligned. I think the underlying clauses are still very extremely useful. Uh, just a lighter shade, a shade of green. And the new clause and the retrofitted ones are just the best in class and align particularly well with the requirements of, of race, to, uh, race to zero. All in all, a real privilege to be a TCLP volunteer, to have played a really small part in this net zero toolkit and to be part of this overall journey in tackling climate change. And I would really encourage all of you to continue supporting the organization, uh, talk to your colleagues, your friends, about supporting a, the organization and coming to the upcoming events. Thank you and apologies for the technical issues earlier. Oh, thank you, Shag, that's really kind. Um, I do have some questions already that um, I'm going to be putting out to the team, but I'll just put out a, a call again. Please do, if you have any questions about the resources, you want to know about anything in more detail, put those questions in the chat and we'll get the, um, the best member of the team to answer them. But some questions I already have. So, um, Making my list here, I've got a question for Phoebe Roberts. What can individual lawyers do to adopt climate conscious drafting? Phoebe, can you help us with that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so many things you can do, and I hope just I'm feeling inspired despite this being part of my day job hearing um, from Tab Tabby and Chirag. So thank you so much. Um, so the best thing you can do in terms of having impact with Chancery Lane Project is to start using climate clauses and to be telling everybody about how you are using climate clauses, which sounds a lot easier than it might actually be. Um, so we have a lot of resources available and also um, lots to learn in our climate clauses in action workshops and net um, zero drafting workshops. But um, if you're unable to attend those, I would suggest just um, going through our website, looking at all the clauses that might apply to your practice sitting down with them, with the colleague, so finding a like-minded, um, sorry, Richard's just come off mute, um, a like-minded colleague to sit down with and brainstorm together how you might use and adapt the clauses in your practice. And I think to think about the clauses as a starting point. So there's something for you to apply your own inquiring legal brain to in your practice, in the work that you do. 
and to think about really how can you start using them and then to start having those climate conscious conversations around those clauses in your practice to then sort of arm yourself to have the conversations outside of your practice group um, with, you know, different people in the firm. If you work um, in-house, it might be having those conversations with your commercial team and the decision makers in your business around how it fits in with your corporate or sustainability strategy and how really it can help you to meet those goals. Um, and it really, your involvement with TCLP and using TCLP clauses doesn't um, have to be overwhelming. And I hope that um, what you can gather from today's call is that there's lots to learn, but also lots of support for you from the TCLP team and resources for you to start implementing clauses. Um, but I think, Becky, just to come back to my first point, the first thing to do A, is to connect with the TCLP community, but really just start reading the clauses and thinking about how you can use them. That's fantastic. Thank you, Phoebe. I've seen a question come in on the chat, which is directed at Shirag. So I hope you're ready, Shirag. Um, Shirag, did you manage to incorporate any incentives for landlords and tenants to reuse materials? Which mechanisms did you find the most effective? Um, uh, no incentives as such, but what we did do was we gave the options to, um, to the landlords and tenants where they couldn't use a certain type of uh, a product, then um, you know, you, you've got different um, tranches that can be used. So um, I think it's just by giving the options so that where the best isn't available, you try the next best. Um, and you know what is really proud is that we've already seen quite a few law firms uh, using this, this clause and wanting to use this clause. I'd probably build on that very slightly if it's okay by saying um, that certainly when I used to work in the construction space, it used to be a standard clause in contracts that you would only ever use brand new materials on a build even if you had re reusable materials that were exactly the same standard, uh, health and safety and technically, and be had to use new materials. And so without wanting to say you don't need to use our clauses for this, I think one of the things that we can do as lawyers is to double check there aren't legacy contract clauses like that, which are preventing people from just organically reusing rather than even having to have the clause in there. Although obviously you should use our clauses and ignore me. Um, so, well, what other questions have I got here? Let's have a little look. So I've got a question saying, um, I can't see any clauses in the practice area or sector I'm interested in. Will you be adding more sectors? Um, who have we got from TCLP who could answer that? Uh, Josh, are you here? Is there, that something you can answer? Uh, absolutely, it's something we're considering uh, within the team. We've got a, a pretty, um, good set of sectors up at the moment but yeah it's certainly something we're thinking about on an ongoing basis there's possibility for that in the future any suggestions would, would be welcome to answer them have we can got I, uh, jenny can you uh, yeah, just, ask what's in the pipeline as well thanks yeah, so, so we've got plenty more clauses coming in the pipeline in in other practice areas that aren't up yet so so don't panic if, if your clause that you drafted isn't featured yet um because i'm sure you'll see it soon but also if we don't have the the practice area that you're particularly interested in that really doesn't matter because our clauses are so adaptable across different practice areas it most of them are about reducing emissions although we, we are broadening that out and there'll be more coming next year on, on related matters but you you really can take something that's designed for one type of agreement particularly related types of agreement if it's organizational requirements and even if it's contract reduction emissions requirements some of the supply chain agreements can, can be adapted for other things so please do not just look at your own practice area when you're looking at our clauses see what you can borrow from other clauses and I think hopefully sometime over the autumn we might have a search function to enable you to kind of look by, by what the clause does and um, hopefully when we can get the text sorted for that so you can kind of look you can type in what the clause does regardless of practice area and sector and find what you need that's fantastic thanks jenny i've just seen in the chat that um matt Gingel has asked a question for Tabby and Shirag. Sorry to put you on the spot, guys. Um, have your PSL slash knowledge teams transposed TCLP drafting concepts into your firm precedents? Um, I can answer that one first if you want. Um, 
Matt, thank you for the question. Yeah, we actually are actively speaking a lot with our PSLs at the moment to try and work out the best way of doing this and whether it's actually into our firm precedents or kind of having a bank of clauses available on our knowledge system that you can pull in for certain contracts. So not changing the full precedent, but um, it is something we are working with a lot with the PSLs and also just with the PSLs making sure they're really aware of the clauses that are out there and kind of the things that we could be starting to put into the contracts and making sure they're speaking to the partners about it as well so um, and hopefully we can get it into some precedent sometime soon that's what we're pushing for so. Uh, Matt I mean the great thing about uh, how Kennedy is that the PSL, Laura Williamson, is very actively involved in TCLP. So um, I've, you know, continued having conversations with her. We are doing the same thing. And we also we do also have knowledge man management sessions for the junior lawyers every month uh, where I've been talking to them about the various uh, TCLP clauses. So we take one clause, we go through it and work out how practically they can be, um, you know, work through with what we do on a daily basis. So 100%, we want to make sure we can incorporate as many TCLP clauses as possible in our in our precedents. That's fantastic. Thanks, Shirag. Um, I've, I've got another question here that says, I'd already seen the Net Zero Explainer dashboard and drafting checklist. What's new about this toolkit? Jenny, do you want to take that on? <laughs> Yes. Um, so in, in addition to, to those resources, we've got some that kind of follow on really nicely from them. So once you've used the checklist of questions when you're reviewing a contract, you can then go to our sample wording document and, and mix and match different definitions and extracts of clauses to use in your own agreements or, or to kind of upgrade existing agreements on our website. You can also look at our offsetting explainer to really understand, because this is a really hot topic at the moment and a really crucial one. So, so that is really helpful. And there's also one of my favorites is a transition map, which is kind of a visual diagram of how you can apply clauses to different areas of an organization. So you can really see that point about oper operationalizing net zero targets within in different places, because every lawyer needs to be a climate lawyer and every part of the organization needs to get involved. So that's one of my favorites. Um, have I missed any? Please. No, I don't think so. Up. No, I think that's great. Um, I've got another question here about tips to persuading clients on how to adopt these clauses. I think that's a really interesting one. Um, I'll, I'll take that question. I think that I think that we're really in an interesting situation um, and that uh, it sounds very trite to say this is really about partnering and we're all in this together, but it really is about partnering, I think, in this situation. Um, I think that if we want, as I said in my earliest talk, if we want to be successful in taking out the GHG, instead of just whacking clauses in contracts and hoping that people are going to comply with them, then we really need this kind of upstream and downstream conversation to take place. We need um, to upskill suppliers, we might need to upskill clients. Um, I know that Unilever, for example, have been incredibly successful and really led the field in a lot of their net zero work. And I went to um, a talk a long time ago where they were explaining that and they said, actually, it came from their clients. Their clients were asking them to come up with solutions and they realized there was a real interesting need there. So I think showing clients how easy it can be um, to put it into a contract. I know that there are challenges, as Phoebe said, but some of the clauses we have, some of the light green clauses to get you started are really easy. Putting in a recital saying that you both acknowledge the Paris Agreement doesn't cost anything. And then bringing people on board with lots of education and um, mutual kind of workshop sessions where you really dig deep into not just your industry, not just your organisation, but the mechanics of your supply chain and how this all sits together. I mean, I know that I have heard from some people People sort of saying scope three is impossible um, and I I think that's a really interesting I used to be I used to do a lot of procurement work and what I would say is that it, it's not impossible to put service level agreements in place for quality delivery and it's really just the same when you extend that out to climate change metrics so oh I've got I've just seen there's another question coming in uh, I've been asked can Becky Clisman say a few words about how practical law are using TCLP clauses. Is that something you can do for us? Absolutely, very happy to do that. Um, so practical law has been heavily involved with the TCLP um, right since the start of the project and has 
obviously sponsored some of the hackathons and been heavily involved in the peer reviewing of a lot of the drafting. Um, alongside that project sits a, an internal project that will um, align with all of our annual maintenance processes of all of our resources. So each of the practical law um, teams are looking at how the clauses that relate to their practice area can and should be inserted into our notes. So you will see as our annual maintenance machine rolls through its, its annual processes, you will start to see TCLP wording popping up in different places. And um, if you have suggestions uh, for where you'd like to see um, TCLP wording use, then by all means do get in contact. I'm sure if you're a practical or subscriber, you know how to use the ask function, but that is definitely one of the ways that you can do that. Because the teams are always really keen, keen to hear that dialogue and understand how people are using TCLP clauses, and that will really inform the resources that we can prioritise to get this wording into. So talk to us, but we are also doing stuff quietly in the background. Many thanks. We've just seen we've had another excellent comment um, on the point about persuading clients to adopt clauses. Um, is there any guidance on how the cost of compliance with the clauses should be shared between the parties? Jenny, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, uh, most of our clauses don't actually mention that because I think it, that's a very, very commercial point to be negotiated between the parties. But we we are starting to kind of flag that in, in, in drafting notes, particularly in, in terms of our just transition work stream because we what we don't want is this risk being just passed down the chain to, to those who aren't as able to comply with it and so I think sometimes we put in a suggestion that that parties discuss this or we put in a suggestion that possibly some finance is made available to, to kind of help with the compliance because the the people that the, the, the organizations maybe the finances or whoever's passing these requirements down the chain are the ones that are going to also gain from it so that they should potentially put some costs up for it i don't know whether that's commercially realistic or not and um, the other thing to to note is that some of our requirements are organ wide organizational requirements and some are just relating to the contract and so for example if you're just requiring that the contract emissions be reduced then that's a very different concept to asking that your partner fulfill certain organizational requirements that are going to be more costly does that help i i think that is really useful but i also saw that phoebe's finger was up do you have um something you want to add to that phoebe yeah, I would just, um, I'd love to add that not all of the TCLP clauses, in fact, I think a lot of the TCLP clauses don't actually impact on that sort of risk return ratio under a contract. So, for example, our termination for a greener supplier, that doesn't inherently have any cost of compliance embedded into it, as Becky's mentioned. The recitals, our, you know, um, NDA terms around, you know, having climate discussions as part of the commercial purpose. There's so many um, of these amazing novel ideas um, in our clauses that don't actually impact on the cost of compliance. Um, and also, um, I think I would also turn you to some of our pre-contract um, tools and clauses that are available, such as, you know, um, the um, RFP questionnaires and DDQs and all these pre-contract documents that can be really used as a carrot um, to, you know, um, you know, work with counterparties in that collaborative way that Becky's mentioned around getting everyone to be working towards net zero together rather than just trying to dump a clause in a document and expecting someone to comply with it. Um, so I think there's Emilio's and there's Robin's clause, which is a new one in the construction phase, as I mentioned, DDQs, um, and Zoe and Bay's clause has a good questionnaire in it as well. Amazing, thank you. I think that I've got three more questions, but I think we only have time for one and I'm going to take them in the order that they came in. And I think this might be one for you actually, Ben. So I hope you're there. Um, the question is, is TCLP engaging with other industries, um, not just lawyers to progress net zero goals, for example, legislative bodies and organizations like the Competition and Markets Authority? Good question, challenging question. Um, short so answer is yes. Uh, thanks, Becky. Uh, short answer is yes, uh, but we're in the foothills, essentially. Um, so you will see on our website that one of our events uh, coming up, an event similar to this, and then a series of workshops, uh, the Climate Clauses and Action workshops that we're running first to the 12th of November, we'll be working with the Sustainable Procurement Pledge, which is a network of 5,000 procurement professionals. I would imagine there are a smattering of lawyers in there, 
but they ain't lawyers. So we're, we're expanding out. Um, a, second, a, a second point that we're in active conversation with is one of the regulators of the world of net zero commitments is in an active conversation uh, with us to explore what role there might be for what I'm calling a full stack of contract, uh, a full stack contract solution to the enforcement uh, and cascading of race to zero uh, and net zero commitments um, made by initial organizations through their supply chains, their value chains, their procurement life cycles. And we're scratching around at the beginning of thinking about how we engage with policy, but essentially our theory of change is first and foremost um, by show, uh, lawyers leading by example, showing what's possible in the world of policy, not just going to knock on the door of policymakers, but to actually go en masse, hundreds or thousands of us to say, this is what we're doing. You might want to think about changing policy, changing legislation, changing regulation, but that's not our primary focus. Our primary focus is to support lawyers in their day jobs. Thanks a lot, Ben. And I think that uh, that just leaves you five minutes to wrap up. Oh, wow. I, yeah, zip through great. it. Okay, I don't, I don't need five minutes. Um, I Do you want to uh, answer one more question? Yeah, yeah. Answer, let's answer one more question. I can okay. say thanks in about a minute. Uh, Simon Turnbull had a really good question. What are the future plans for rolling out TCLP clauses across different regions such as US and APAC? Oh, am I answering that? Sorry. I was going to jump in and spruik um, all the APAC yeah. plans that we have at the moment. So myself and Charlie Turner on the call here lead the APAC region. So we've got an APAC launch coming up um, in a few weeks um, just to launch the toolkit in an APAC friendly time zone and then also be running the supply chains, um, corporate governance and built environment workshops at lunchtime um, in our time zone so that covers most of the APAC region. So if you have colleagues and contacts um, at that um, in that time zone please let us know but also um, what we will be launching um, after COP is our onboarding call and clinic sessions, which is a half an hour onboarding call for anyone who's new to the TCLP community. And then a one hour session where lawyers can book in for 15 minutes, one-to-one -one with a TCLP team member. And we'll be running those three times a week. Um, they'll be crossing all time zones. We're totally global and worldwide. So um, wherever you are all over the world, you'll be able to um, book in and speak to someone at TCLP and get onboarded. So again, if you have colleagues, um, anywhere across the globe, um, they'll be able to book in to any of those sessions. Um, and they'll be starting next week, I believe. They will. So I'm going to just wrap up on that, which I think if you're following the chat, thank you, Matilda, former staff member who we can't get away from, luckily, uh, is pointing out that we have translations uh, put together by uh, a couple of our participant organisations uh, and, and the staff there in the US. So we have an initial set of uh, translations into the US. Uh, we are going immediately after this onto a call with a couple of law firms based out of Mexico who've taken 60 of our clauses and translated them into both jurisdictionally specific language and Spanish. We're then going on to figuring out how we translate those into Spanish Spanish, not Mexican Spanish. We have conversations in Turkey, in Spain, in France, in Singapore, again in Australia, a uh, range of other jurisdictions about how we think about both transposing jurisdiction to ju jurisdictionally specific um, legal language and linguistically specific language, aka different languages. Um, we have a version control conundrum and challenge awaiting us for 2022, which we're looking forward to getting, getting stuck into. I wasn't expecting to answer questions and in one minute I'm supposed to wrap up and say thank you. I honestly have to say I am profoundly humbled and moved by the scale of this endeavour and the speed at which it's it's developed into what we have before us now. The biggest thanks has to go to the more than 450 people we said thank you to last night for contributing uh, throughout the process of developing the new drafting and working on the retrofit of our of our existing clauses. That's 450 out of a community of 1,300 active uh, lawyers and legal professionals. It's quite remarkable where we've come to in just less than two years. 
I also have to say a very special but unname checked thanks to some of the key firms whose shoulders we've stood on over especially the last six to eight weeks when we've had a bunch of challenges around peer review and editorial. There are a bunch of firms you will remain unnamed because that's the spirit of the project. Um, but you know who you are and I think you're all on this call. Uh, without you, we wouldn't be where we are today. I have to say a huge thank you to the team without name because they're all bloody brilliant. And I have to say thank you to our funders who I will name, which is Climate Works, Loudest Foundation and QCF. Without their funding, we would not be here. But the biggest thanks is the thanks for what you guys do next, going forward, engaging with the Chancellor Lane project, taking the clauses, making them your own, working with us with our events, our workshops and our clinics, signing up to our newsletter and becoming an active part of this remarkable movement we're creating. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Ben, and thank you everybody for coming today. Um, please go forth, sign up to the newsletter, come to our events and use our clauses. Let's take some carbon out, everybody. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Becky. Oh, thank you so much, everybody. <laughs>